Love that background music. Hey everyone, Wazoo here, and this is another game project adventure with the Braylib. As you can see in front of you, I've got a basic grid coming up with cells on it and a avatar that we are controlling. And you'll notice in the top left corner, we've got a few statistics. But let's go through a little bit of a demo first to showcase what we'll be working on today. Okay, so you can hear that we're around the tiles. Okay, see how we've, we can travel around our map. We can do a little zoom in and we can zoom out as well using the mouse wheel. Okay, that's cool. So let's zoom it all the way in a little bit. Yeah, and you'll notice in the top left corner that I'm showing a camera target, a camera zoom level, the player health, a player XP, a player money count, so a track of how much money the player has in this theoretical game, as well as the health of an orc. Now, where's the orc, you say? Well, notice how we have this little dungeon, dungeon portal. So if we hit E to enter, we are in the dungeon. And notice that the background music changes. It's now a, a creepier dungeon-y vibe. And over here, we've got an orc. And if we brush up against him, we then start attacking the orc. Oh, we got him. We got ourselves a nice little chest. Let's see how much we get when we pick that up. All right. And we can return to the forest by going back to the dungeon and hitting E. And we're back in the forest. So yeah, so that's basically all that we will be covering today. There's a lot of little pieces here. Don't let this simple little demo fool you. There's a lot of things behind the scenes going on here, but I hope that we can make our way through all of this within one video. And it is more than possible using the magic of Raylib and C. So grab yourselves your favorite drink, sit back and relax. Well, maybe not really sit back and relax, but uh, grab your notebook, take some notes, or if you want to pull up the source code before we get started and follow through as we build this thing together, I think this is going to be a really interesting tutorial. So before we get started, just be sure to like the channel, subscribe for updates, uh, leave a comment down below on things that might be missing as we go through this very basic RPG development experience. Okay, so we're using Visual Studio 2022 as we've done in some of my previous videos using Raylib. So let's go ahead and create, oh, I did, I did forget to mention, please use the timestamps down below. This is probably going to be quite a long video and I will try and time mark where I'm doing something different. So if you're already familiar with some of the territory that I'm covering, then feel free to skip ahead to whatever you feel is where you need the most help with. So here we are at the main menu of Visual Studio. So let's go ahead and create a new project. And we've done this in all my other videos so far. This isn't anything different. So we are going to start with a console app and hit next. And let's start with a 2D RPG tutorial. Let's go with that. Okay, hit the create button. And we get our familiar welcome sign. Okay, we get our familiar welcome page. We've got our project set up over here on the right, at least in my view. And on the left, we've got our familiar sort of main uh, generated hello world project. So let's go ahead and erase that. We can erase, include the out stream. And back here in our source files, let's rename our project to just be main.c. That way we're working with Visual Studio's built-in C compiler. We're not worried about C++. Okay, so first things first, well, let's put in the basics of Raylib using the Raylib framework as we've covered in some of my other videos. So let's include raylib.h and let's include raymath.h. Okay, and we are gonna have a few different functions stubbed out 
we're going to have a game startup function, a game update, game render, and game shutdown. And these are kind of the four lifecycle methods of a basic game project. Again, if you're not familiar with these, we'll be covering them here, but I do go over them in a little bit more detail in other videos. And then we will define a screen width of 800 pixels wide and a screen height of 600. And then in our main program here, we are going to call it init window given the screen width and screen height and then give our project a name which is just raylib 2 d rpg we're going to set the target fps to be 60 and then we're going to be calling our game startup function we'll put things into an infinite while loop until we want to close the window then we call the game update function we begin drawing we're going to clear our background to gray then we're going to call our game render function and finally end the drawing for the frame of this loop of the game. And then we'll start back at the beginning and we'll keep looping infinitely until the user wants to close the window with the escape key or the X on the window itself. So we'll call game shutdown, then close window, and then finally return zero. So let's go ahead and, oh, we won't be able to, let's quickly stub out these four functions here. So just empty functions for now, just to test our main loop and verify that everything works. So let's hit the debugger. Let's start things up and we should see a basic window come up. Okay, the basic window comes up, 800 by 600 with a gray background. We hit escape, which exits the main loop and we get kicked back into our code here. So everything looks good. Okay, so first things first, in our game startup function, we are gonna call init audio device to just initialize our audio device. We won't be using any sound yet, but I just like to get in the habit of calling this right away. And the last thing we'll do in the game shutdown function is close audio device, just to shut things down. Okay, and then what we are gonna start working with first is a tile map. And I will be including a link to all the resources that I'm using in this game for the artwork. I've been going to Kenny.nl, who is a who creates a lot of game assets for use in just about any indie project you want to work with. There's so many free ones available on his site, and you can offer a donation if you so choose. Okay, so before we get into the code for creating for loading a tile map and then displaying the tiles that we want let's dive into just a little bit of theory and so the idea is that we are going to be working with this tile map here i'll put a link to it in the description of this video down below but it is freely available from kenny.nl you can use this in other games, of course. So basically what we're going to do is uh, we're going we're gonna to employ a little bit of math here to figure things out. So if you'll notice in the bottom right hand corner, paint.net is telling us that this image is 128 by 80. So we've got all of these different tiles laid out on this uh, image, which normally we call like a, a tile map or texture map. And so what the idea is, instead of in our previous videos, we've loaded, we've been loading these images individually. Like all of our art assets has been individual art assets that we load into the engine and then we convert them to textures and then make use of them in our game render loop. In larger game projects, you usually have something like this, which is a tile map, which is a whole bunch of individual assets compressed together in a single image. And then the idea is that you load up the single image into memory, and then you can reference each section of the image that you wanna to draw to the screen in your render method. Hopefully I didn't lose you there. You'll be understanding as we as we work with this. So we've got an image here of size 128 by 80, okay? So what we need to do first is just to just figure out how big each of these images are, all these assets are. And so normally what I do is I select the rectangle select, and then I use this menu to grab a, or to specify a fixed size, and then I play with the width and height to create a square that I can use to gauge how big each of these assets are. Eight by eight textures that are in this tile map. But as you can see, we can update the width and height to 12. 
and then we can see how big 12 by 12 is. So there it's already way too big. And so let's reduce it down to eight by eight. So we've got an eight by eight selector here. And then this is what I do to select the particular asset that I wanna to use to draw. So we've got 128 by 80. So if we take uh, 128 pixels across divided by eight, so we get 16 textures across, 16 individual tiles. And then we get 80 pixels high. The image is 80 pixels high divided by eight. We get 10. Okay, so we get 10. It is 10 tiles high by 16. So we've got things sort of def defined on this level. So let's go back to our code and let's specify a tile width and tile height. So let's create a, a define of tile width of eight and a hashtag define of tile height of eight. Okay, so we've defined a tile width and a tile height of eight. I like to break them apart instead of just a single tile size parameter, or not parameter, a, a single tile size variable, because perhaps you're gonna be using a texture map that is like eight pixels wide by 10 pixels high, something like that, right? So this way, this gives you a little bit of flexibility into working with different texture maps or different tile maps, sorry. Okay, and then what we will do is similar to our other programs here, we will define another variable called max textures. And right now it's just one. And then within an enum, we're gonna declare a texture tile map and we're gonna assign it a value of zero. And then finally, it, an array of texture 2D objects called textures, which is of size max underscore textures. So let's load this image up first. So after a call to init audio device, we're gonna load, we're gonna call the load image function with the path of our texture map, our tile map, sorry, the path of our tile map into load image, which then gets stored into a image object. Then we are going to make the next step of assigning the texture returned from load texture from image of that given image, and we're gonna store it in that textures array at the index of texture tile map. And then finally, since we no longer need the image, we're gonna call unload image. Okay, and then before we forget, in the game shutdown code, we are gonna loop through our textures array and we are gonna call unload texture on each of the textures, which in this case is only one, but it's a good habit to get into. We've got this giant texture map in, in memory now, so how do we work with it? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a world, what I call a world, we're gonna create a grid and then render each individual tile of that grid. Okay, so let's create some two new defines of world width of 20 and world height of 20. So this isn't really 20 pixels. What this is is 20, which is 20 times tile and the tile height here is tw or the world height is 20 times tile height. So instead of using the actual pixel number, which is which is this, I'm just declaring this value in terms of how many tiles wide and high that our world is. Okay, and then we're gonna find, define a tile. So here we're gonna have a struct. I'm, I've given it the name S tile. And so all we have right now is two components, two integer components, X and Y. And then what we're gonna do is declare a array, a 2D array of world width and world height size. And we're just gonna give it, give it the name world and it's of type S tile. So we're gonna track our individual tiles within this 2D array grid. So let's go ahead and create a double for loop in our game startup. So after we call unload image, Okay, and you'll see here we've got a double for loop. So for in i equals zero, so i is less than the world width. And then for j is zero and j is less than world height. And we're gonna iterate through this multi-dimensional array. And for each entry in the array, we are gonna call a, we're gonna initialize the S tile uh, member 
of the, in that position, in that index of ij. And we're going to assign i to be the x component and j to be the y component. So we've got a world kind of initialized, or a grid at any rate. And let's go ahead and draw something just to test everything out. So in our game render function, let's call, we're going to create another double for loop, which will just iterate through our same world grid that we created above. And here's where we get, okay, so outside the for loop, we're just going to declare an instance of S tile. And then in here, we are going to tile equals world ij. Okay, and then we are going to have, we're also going to have two two integers that are going to be tracking the index, the x and y index of the texture we're trying to draw from that texture map that I showed you previously. So int tile texture, here how about this? Texture index x equals zero and int texture index y equals zero. Maybe that's a lot easier to track. So for now, we're just going to draw a single dirt uh, tile. So if we look on our image here, this is the one that I want to draw right here. So it's kind of like a dark background, but with a, a basically I call it dirt. I don't know if it's supposed to be dirt, but whatever. So we can see here that we are zero. This is the zeroth index. One, two, three, four. So it's four units across and then zero, one, two, three, four, four units down. Okay, so texture index x equals four and texture index underscore y equals four. So we're gonna draw four, four, okay? And then our draw texture pro function is the one we're gonna be using to draw the specified index of our tile map. But before we do that, we have to create a rectangle representing the source and then the destination. So the source is tracking what section of that tile map we want to grab from the image. We're going to be casting texture index x to a float and then texture index y to a float. And our width and height are going to be the tile width and tile height. So that's eight and eight. So we've, we've got our little square that we, we want to pull from that image. And now we specify a rectangle of where we want to draw it to. So we want to draw it to tile X times the tile width. And then the tile Y component times the tile height, which is eight again. And then again, the width and height, which is just tile width and tile height. For the origin, we're just leaving it at zero, zero. We don't need to do anything there. And then finally, we just need to call draw texture pro. And for the first parameter, we're using the texture 2D object of our tile map. We're specifying the source and the destination parameters, and then the origin, the zoom level, which is 0.0, .0 we're gonna leave it at that. And then the color tint that we're gonna to apply th to things, which is gonna be white in this case. So the next thing we're going to do, so a new object that we're bringing into this tutorial compared to my others is the use of a camera. So if you'll notice from other 2D RPG games, you can have several different kinds of cameras, which I'll try to overlay into this explanation here. So you first have basically what I call a Zelda camera, and this is where you've got a overall view of a room and then your player can move all around that room. So the camera doesn't move, it just shows the borders of the room and you're moving around as you would and you see yourself moving all over the screen. The next kind of camera that we normally see in a 2D RPG is maybe what you would call a Final Fantasy or a Ultima camera, which is where the, the camera is targeted on your particular avatar that you're moving around a map. And so the screen is centered around your character. And as you move through the map, then the character's position is updated, but you're moving yourself through a 2D map. And so we're gonna to attempt to create what I call an Ultima camera, which is where your avatar, your player is at the middle of the screen, middle of the grid, 
and then the world kind of gets updated around that that player and so what we need to use for that in terms of raylib speak it's an object called camera 2d so let's declare our camera here camera 2d and i'm just going to call it camera and we're going to initialize it so after we create our grid in that double for loop what we're going to then do is initialize our camera so we have a few very a few fields that a camera accepts a camera uses an offset rotation a target and a zoom so we're going to be making use of all of these all of these fields as we put our 2d camera together so for the target uh, we're going to start at zero zero so a vector two struct of just zero zero and then a camera offset vector two of let's see screen width divided by two cast it to a float and then a screen height divided by two cast it to a float and a rotation is going to be zero we want to keep things okay at zero and then a zoom factor i am going to start off with a zoom of three and one of the first few things we'll be doing is using the mouse wheel to work with that zoom level and then you can decide for yourself what what zoom level you want for your camera in your game okay so then what we need to do is in the render function we need to make use of that camera so we start by calling a method called begin mode 2d so we're entering a 2d mode and we're going to pass in the camera that we're using which in our case is just called camera and now everything in our game world is rendered according to the uh, the matrix the 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 construction of that camera and then at the end of this function once we've drawn everything for our level we then call end mode 2d so what we want to do in the update function here is make use of the mouse wheel okay so what we're going to do is we are going to call a method called get mouse wheel move and it's going to return a a float value that we're going to stick into the wheel variable so if wheel is not equal to zero then we're going to declare a a zoom increment of 0 0.125 units basically and so we're going to update the camera zoom plus equals wheel times zoom increment and then another thing we need to do is we need to update we need to constantly update the camera target to be something in our update loop so we're going to call it a vector 2 and then for now we're just going to use 0 0 but we'll be updating this as we add a player to move through the map something to follow so for this method to work, we need to multiply the texture index we're pulling in by tile width and the texture index y times tile height to account, since we're just giving it the indexes into that tile map image, we have to remember to multiply by the width and height of each tile. So let's go ahead and hit the render button and we now see our grid of the, the tile square that we're after. And notice how far in we can zoom with the mouse wheel going in and out. So maybe I should make that inc increment a little bit higher just to make it the zoom a little bit faster. Okay, but I am going to start at a zoom of three, a zoom level of three. And then I'm gonna put in some guards here just, just to have some extra logic in that if our Let's see if our zoom level is less than three. So if camera.zoom is less than three, then we're gonna lock it at three. And if our camera.zoom is greater than eight, then we're gonna lock it at eight. And so you can play, these are, aren't numbers that I'm making up. If you zoom in and out, then you'll see what kind of zoom levels we're working with. So let's go ahead and quickly demo that now, and then I will show you how to display the actual values of the camera zoom. 
Okay, so notice I can't zoom in anymore. I'm, you can't, of course, see my finger on my mouse wheel, but I'm trying to zoom in and we're locking it here. And then I'm going to zoom out and we've now locked it at this point. Okay, so, so far so good. So what is the zoom value? You might be saying there's no way to, to tell without displaying something to the screen. So let's create a status box, like a little text display of what we're going to be working or what we want to output to the to the screen to track what's going on. So after our end mode TD, 2D, let's go ahead and create some rectangles that we can draw in. Okay, so we are going to be calling draw rectangle at X and Y coordinates of 5, 5, a width of 330 and a height of 120. And the background, so this the background for this rectangle is going to be a faded sky blue. So basically like a, a translucent blue blue color. And then we're going to use draw rectangle lines to draw a border around this rectangle. So again, at X, Y position of 5, and then a width of 330 and a height of 120 pixels and a border color of blue. Okay, and then what we're going to do is we are going to then use draw text to display some data for us. So draw text, and we can use a method called text format. And basically, like it's a, a helper method to convert float variables or any kind of number into a string that can be used to, dis to display in draw text. So we're going to create a camera target string and then use percent 0.062f and then percent 0.062f. And what are those variables you might be asking? It is the camera.target.x and the camera.target.y. And then we're going to be drawing it at x of 15 and y of 10 and then a font size of 14 and a yellow color. Now again we've used draw text in every one of my videos before so if you're unfamiliar with how that's working I do go over it a lot in other videos as well. On the next line down we want to call a draw text again with a text format and we want to draw the current camera zoom value. So we're going to convert the camera zoom, which is a float, into a value that can be formatted by the string, and then drawn at x and y of 15 and 30, font size of 14, and then yellow color. So let's go ahead and run this again. Okay, and you can see here we've got a camera target of 0, 0, and a camera zoom level of 3, and as I zoom in, then this value updates until we hit 8 and then if I want to go backwards until we hit 3 it then locks us down at 3. Okay that's pretty cool. So again you'll be able to zoom in and out and then discover for yourself what kind of zoom level you want. Okay so now we are going to create a entity that we are going to then draw our camera around. So back at the top we're going to create another struct we can place it after the camera and we're just going to call it entity. And so far we only have an X and a Y component. And then I'm just going to declare uh, an entity player. Okay. And then in game startup, after we set up our camera or let's, before we set up our camera, after the double for loop, we are going to create a, we're going to define what the player is. So the player is going to start off at X and Y x of 3 and y of 3, of course, multiplied by tile width and tile height. So basically 8 times 3, and then a y position of 8 times 3. And we're going to update this camera target here because we want to we want to keep our player centered in the middle of the camera. So our target is going to be player.x and then player.y. Okay, so far so good. Okay, and then down here in the game update, instead of uh, keeping our target locked on 0, 0, we are again going to keep updating our camera target to be player.x and player.y. Okay, and then in our render function, before we end, after a double loop of, of drawing the grid, before we call end mode 2D, 2D, we want to then draw the player. So we are going to take these same lines of code and 
instead of, okay, so texture index X. So let's go back to our artwork here. And this is the player. This is the tile that I've, I'm going to be using as our player. You can use anything else that you want. Feel free. And so this is at uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. This is at X of 4 and then Y of 0 because it's the first, obviously, in the first row of this tile map. Okay, so we're, we're going to declare our source to be 4 times tile width. And let's put that in brackets and then cast that to a float. And then 0 times tile height, which I know is going to be 0, but let's just keep it here so we understand what's happening. Convert that to a float. And then it's again, it's going to be tile width and a tile height. And then for our destination, what we're going to declare it as instead of tile.x, it is going to be camera target.x. Or camera target.x times tile width and then camera target.y. Okay, this time we don't need the times tile width, so just camera target.x and camera target.y and then a tile height, a tile width and tile height. Okay, again our origin is 0, 0, and then we're going to call the same draw texture pro function textures, texture tile map, giving it our source, destination, our origin point, 0.0, .0 for our rotation, and then a white color tint. And I know that we've been cut and pasting the same looking four lines, so we're going to create a function for it right after this. So let's go ahead and run it. Okay, so notice how our camera is now centered on our avatar. And we can't move anything yet. We can't do anything. So we can't showcase how this is working. Okay, so we can zoom in and out. So now what do we do? Let's create a let's create a function to handle drawing our texture because we are going to be doing this a lot. We're going to be calling it a lot. So before our after our game shutdown function, let's create a new one called draw tile. And we're going to have four parameters into draw tile. So we're going to have our, our X position, our Y position, texture index X, and then our texture index Y coordinate. And let's just update. Those variables there. Okay. So we're declaring our source again of tile width times the text texture index X and then the tile height times the texture index Y converting that to a float. Okay. And then a width and a height of tile width and tile height as we've already seen. And so then we're declaring a destination, a rectangle to be of position post X and then post Y and then tile width and tile height all converted to floats an origin of zero and then calling our draw texture pro function. So now we can replace our couple of lines here. Okay, so this is our player. So what we can do here is draw a tile and then camera.target.x, camera.target.y, and then four zero. And before I forget, let's just define this function up above. Let's put the function prototype up top here. Okay. And then let's go back and update the render loop of this. And let's use draw tile. Let's see. Tile dot x times tile width and then tile.y times tile width, and then texture index x and texture index y. So let's quickly run this and just to make sure everything looks okay. Okay, good. So we've got things drawing correctly. So let's go ahead and update the, the map there. So if we use the keyboard, the keyboard arrow keys, we're gonna move our player around which would be really cool. So we've used the is, is pressed method before, which looks at the keyboard. So what we're going to do here is 
uh, we're going to store player.x into a variable called x. So player position x, and then player position y, we're going to store into a, another variable called y. Okay, so then if is key pressed key left, we are going to be moving backwards on the x axis. So x minus equals 1 times tile width. And then else if is key pressed key underscore right, we are going to be doing plus equals 1 times tile width. Else if is key pressed key dot up, then y minus equals 1 times tile height. And else if is key pressed key down, so the down arrow, then y plus equals 1 times tile height. Okay, and we also need to keep track uh, if we even... So let's go ahead and, and update our player position again. So player.x equals x and player.y equals y. Okay, and then our camera target our camera target is already updating every frame by resetting itself to the updated player x and player y position. So let's go ahead and hit run. And this really should be all we need. Okay, so we can use the arrow keys and notice how we're now moving around the map with our camera centered on our player as the target. So we can zoom in a little bit and we can zoom out and we can go past the edges of the map because we don't have any kind of collision detection, but this is a really cool start. Okay, so next what we're gonna do is we are gonna draw different, different tiles. So let's go back to our, let's go back to our, the top where we're declaring everything and let's create a another enum here before or I guess right after our tile. No, right before our tile. We'll just call it an enum of tile type. And so I've come up with a few. So tile type of dirt, of grass, of tree, and stone. Okay, and that'll be so four different tiles that we're drawing from our texture map. We're gonna update our tile to track a type. So int type. So that's gonna track a tile of type, tile type. Oh, that's a lot of uses of the word type. Okay, so what we are going to do in our initialize method, in our game startup code here, right when we've uh, assigned the X and the Y, we're going to create a new one called type, and we're going to call a function called get random value. And get random value takes two integers, a minimum and a maximum, and just grabs you a random one in between those two boundaries. So the first boundary the minimum is going to be tile type of dirt which is zero and then our maximum is going to be tile type of tree and we're going to store that in the type variable so then let's go back to our let's go back to our render function okay and then when we store the value of the tile into from the world ij part here let's now create a switch statement for working with that type Okay, so switch tile.type. Okay, so we've got a switch statement here. Uh, given the tile type from the given tile that we're trying to render, if our tile type is tile type dirt, then we're going to be using the an x index of 4 and a y index of 4 in that texture map. And if it's grass, then we are going to be using, this is what I'm calling grass. So it'll be an x position of 5 and a y position of four. So x of five, y is four. And then a tree is gonna be just below this. So I'm using this fatter tree right here. And so this is basically five, five. So index five, five. So here texture x index of five and an index y of five. We've got a tile type dirt. It is setting the x coordinate to be four, y coordinate of four on our tile map. Here, maybe I can do this. There we go. X coordinate of four, Y coordinate four on this tile map. And then when we want to work with grass, it is an X coordinate of five, since we're one, one tile over to the right, and a Y coordinate of four. And then when we want to work with a tree, it is going to be this fatter tree right here. 
And so this is going to be an x of 5 and a y coordinate of 5. And you see the bug. Okay, let's remove this. Remove those two lines. So now we get a little bit of a forest. We can run around. Okay, that's pretty cool. We can zoom in. Zoom out. Okay, I like that. So now let's create a, a way, a dungeon. So basically a way to go between maps. So what I'm going to do is we're going to create two things here. So I'm going to create a, actually maybe three things. So we're going to create another grid which represents our dungeon uh, just because it's going to have different tiles than what we have in our regular world grid that we've been working with. So a second grid and then we're going to be creating a way to link the two together so i'm going to create another entity which we're going to call a dungeon gate and then if a, if the player goes on to this dungeon gate and hits a key then they'll be transported into the dungeon map and vice versa so let's go back here and in our world after the declaration of our world let's create the same thing just for ease of use and we will call it dungeon okay so we've got two arrays one for world and one for dungeon and then in our startup function here what we can do is just duplicate what we're doing for world only also call it for dungeon so we can set up the dungeon grid and instead of a random value what we're going to do is we're just going to assign it to be tile type dirt so basically that first entry okay and then we are going to be basically drawing the same th okay so now let's create an entity to represent that dungeon gate i was talking about so after we call s entity player let's call s entity dungeon gate okay and then after we initialize our player Okay, so our dungeon gate is going to be at coordinates 10, 10, so 10 times tile width, and then a Y of tile height times 10. So then all we have to do is in the render method, after we render our grid and before we render our player, let's draw the dungeon gate. Okay, so there's our player. So draw render player. So let's render our dungeon gate. And we're going to be using the eight and nine indexes into our tile map. So this is this lovely little tile right here. I guess we could also use this one if you want. If you don't want this, these steps or whatever this is at the bottom of this tile, then you can also update it to this. Or we can use this doorway right here. Anything you want. So let's draw this and see what it looks like. We'll at least see the dungeon gate. Okay, so here's the dungeon gate. It shows up on our map. Now, of course, we're walking over it and it doesn't do anything because we're not telling the game what we need to do differently when we're interacting with this dungeon gate. So let's exit the program here. And what we are going to be doing is in the update function here. So after, maybe after we update all the, when we update, after we update the camera target, let's go ahead and look. So if is key pressed key e so e for enter so what we want to do is if player dot x equals dungeon gate dot x and player dot y equals dungeon underscore gate dot y then what we want to do is enter our dungeon so now we have a problem well not really a problem but now we have a challenge what do we want to do how do we want to switch between these different grids so we've got one grid of tiles set up for our world and one grid of tiles set up for our dungeon and so what i've come up with which is just my way of tackling this problem right now is i'm i came up with a concept of zones so what i'm going to have is okay after our declaration of tiles i'm going to have another enum and this is for handling the zones Okay, so I've got a zone all and a zone world and a zone dungeon. So basically what I want to try and do is eventually what's going to happen is we're going to have entities that are only in one zone and not in the other. Or we're going to have an entity that's in both. So for example, our dungeon gate. Our dungeon gate needs to be 
or I want our dungeon gate to be in both the world, the world tile grid, and the dungeon tile grid, because the player has to travel back and forth between the two worlds. So this idea of having a zone, okay, so what I'm then going to do is, I'll name that to be E-Zone, okay, and then for our entity, let's keep track of which zone we're in. So E zone zone in our entity. Okay, so we're going to start up by saying that, okay, so the player is going to be starting in the world. So zone world is going to be part of zone world to start off with. And the gate, uh, I came up with this concept of zone all. And so maybe this will be a little bit more obvious as we work this. So the gate is going to exist in both. And so I'm using a zone all tag to kind of describe something that's going to need to exist in multiple grids. Hopefully that is not too confusing. And so what we want to do in the update function, oh, okay. So now what we want to do in the render function, we've set up our two different grids. So our dungeon grid and our world grid. Okay, so in our update function here, so what we want to do here uh, before we take the tile, or game render, sorry, before when we take the tile, before we pull, we have to define which zone we're pulling that tile from. Okay, so if player.zone is zone world, then tile equals world i j else if player dot zone equals zone dungeon then tile equals dungeon i j okay and remember the dungeon every tile is is going to be the dirt for now and okay so in the update function let's go back there so if we in, well, let's update this to do right here. So we, we're on top of the dungeon gate entity and we've hit the E key. So if that's the case, then our if player.zone equals zone world, then we want to transfer to the dungeon. So player.zone equals zone underscore dungeon. Okay, else if player.zone equals zone dungeon then we want to transfer our player back to the world. So player.zone equals zone.world. Okay, so I think this is all we need. Let's go ahead and start this up. Hopefully that wasn't too confusing. Okay, so we've got our player moving around. We are on, we can move over our dungeon gate. And now if we're stepping over it and we hit the E, our map transfers to the dungeon tile map or the dungeon grid, sorry, which is very cool. And if we go back on this entity, hit E again, we should go back to the world. Okay, very cool. And if we hit E anywhere on this world, it doesn't do anything. And if we hit E anywhere in this dungeon, it shouldn't do anything. Perfect. Okay, so now let's create an orc entity and we'll position it in the dungeon. Okay, so after we declare our dungeon gate, let's create another entity for orc. And let's set up our orc to be within the dungeon zone. Okay, so after our dungeon gate declaration, after our dungeon gate declaration, we can declare an orc. So it's gonna be of tile width times three and a Y position of tile height times three. So let's, maybe let's put that at five, five. So we're closer to the gate. Okay, so five, five. And the zone that we're in is zone dungeon. And then all we need to do is update our render function again to only draw the orc if our player is in the dungeon zone. So basically if the zones match. Okay, so after we render or after we render the gate, we can have some more logic here. So if orc.zone equals player.zone, so if they're in the same zone then let's go ahead and draw the orc. So draw tile, orc.x, and then orc.y, and then 11 and zero is gonna be the position of our orc texture in the tile map. 
So it is this one right here, which is at x coordinates of 11, 11 units across, and then zero units down because it's in the top row. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this. And okay, so notice how there's no orc showing up here in the map. And if we go into our dungeon, we should see the orc right here, which we do, perfect. So we can run through our orc, our orc doesn't move, but at least he's only drawing when we're in the dungeon. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is a little bit of combat. Combat is a little bit tricky in the in a game like this. I didn't want to get too involved in a uh, into building out combat for this. There's many ways you can do combat in a game like this. So normally, like in you can have a Final Fantasy type of idea where you've got a side view of your battlefield and you can have units on your left and units on your right and then you individually go through all the all the units in your party and choose actions for each one then you can also do a basically an ultima type of battle where you have a battlefield type of idea a battlefield type of map sorry that the players are moving in and then again for each player you have different actions that you can perform depending on what you want to do for combat or another way that combat is done in some roguelikes today, which is what we're going to do for this game, is if you bump into the entity, then it's the same as if you're attacking that entity. So if you want to attack the orc, then you bump into the orc. We are going to check for collisions between the orc and the player. So before we update the X and the Y, so after our wheel uh, wheel handle our mouse wheel handler what we are going to do is check for orc collisions okay so if first of all if the player player dot zone equals orc dot zone and orc dot x equals x and orc dot y equals y so basically we're right on top the player is right on top of that of that orc then here's where we handle combat because we're in the right zone we're on the orc right now and so what we're going to do here is we're going to create a there's much better ways to do combat we won't we won't get too much into combat calculations here but all i'm going to do is basically roll a 2d10 from the D, &D type of speak so we're going to have a variable an integer variable called damage and we are going to get a random value between 2 and 20. So basically a 2d10, if my math is right. So we have two 10-sided dice that we're rolling for our damage that we're going to hit against our orc. Okay, so then we are going to need to keep track of our health and how much damage we're doing. Okay, so I'm going to declare in our entity struct an int health and an int damage. Okay, so let's see. Our player is going to have a health of 100. And we'll just initialize damage to be 0. And same thing with orc. An orc is going to have a health of 100 and a damage of 0. Okay, so if we have, if our player hits our orc which basically just means if they try to occupy the same space then the game will calculate a collision between the two and then go into this damage uh, runoff here so our orc health we're going to subtract it subtract the damage from this health and then we're going to keep track of this damage each round and that's so that we can display it above the orc because we kind of wanted we want to create a way of giving some visual feedback to the player like how much we're hitting this orc for okay and then so once that happens if our orc health is less than zero then the orc is dead so we got to do what to do here so we got to basically not draw the orc anymore and maybe increase the 
uh, experience level of the player, you know, maybe drop a treasure chest, something like that. Okay, so if we're not, if we're not on top of the orc, then let's update our player X and player Y as we've always been doing. And let's update our target based on being moved. Okay, so before we do anything, we, we won't be able to tell if we're hitting the orc or not. We won't be able to properly test this until we track a few more variables here. So back in our entity, let's track a alive variable. So bool is alive. So our player by default is gonna be alive is alive equals true. And our orc is also gonna be is alive true. And then for our rendering, uh, before we draw the orc, we're gonna just make sure that the orc is alive. So if orc is alive, then draw the orc. Pretty simple there. Okay, if orc health is less, than, oh, that's right. Okay, so if orc health is less than zero, then now let's update it to be orc is alive equals false. And we can spawn a treasure chest here, but for now, let's just turn off our orc. And let's go ahead and display our damage that we're doing. So back in our readout panel here, we've got our camera zoom, our camera target. Let's go ahead and draw our health. So we're gonna call draw text again, and let's just, I created a string called player health and then a percent D using text format to draw player.health. And then we're gonna draw it at X and Y of 15 and 50 of font type 14, font size of 14 and color yellow. Okay, and then if our orc is alive, I'm going to draw text of our orc health and just so just specify the orc health at 15 x of 15 and y of 110 and you'll see why i'm drawing it so low uh, shortly of font size 14 and font color yellow so let's go ahead and run this now player health of 100 and our orc health of 100 let's go into the dungeon and let's keep bumping the orc and notice that our health is going down each time so once it gets under zero, the orc disappears, which it does. So what is next? So let's track a XP and money. So back in our entity, let's create some new fields. I'll just call them ints again. So int money and int experience. Okay, so we've got an experience field, we've got a money field, and let's go ahead and initialize ourselves with a money of a thousand. And so what I'm, what I normally do, what I normally recommend doing is just like working with money on web servers, which is what I do normally during the day, my day job is you should be tracking the lowest currency, lowest unit of currency. And then it's much easier to convert that to the higher currencies or to different currencies altogether. So for example, copper, so in most video games, or at least not most, in World of Warcraft, everything, every money, every bit of money that you have is tracked in terms of copper units because a copper piece is the lowest amount of money that you can have. So you can have copper and then 100 copper is one silver and then is it 1,000 silvers is worth one gold or 100 silvers? Underneath it all, it is just everything is in the same base unit of copper. It's the easiest thing to work with when you keep everything at the lowest common denominator. So we'll track our money at at a thousand copper units here and then experience. Let's just start off at zero. Okay, and then the orc, it will have a, a money of, let's see, how much would, oh, you know what? Let's not have but we can have an experience. So how much experience is the orc gonna be worth? And let's create a random value between, I don't know, let's say 10 and 100. So somewhere between 10 and 100, it will be the experience, the experience points of this orc. 
And let's go ahead and also create another entity for chest. So basically treasure chest. Then let's reinitialize it to be uh, zero. Kind of like this. Our orc is now killed. So let's go ahead and spawn our treasure chest. So first what we're going to do is we are going to player experience plus equals the orc experience. So we're going to add the experience from our orc. And then what we're going to do is create a chest. So chest um, is alive equals true. And we're going to drop the chest where the orc was. So chest X and chest Y equals orc X and orc Y. And we're going to set the alive flag to true. And the zone is going to be the same as the orc zone. And the money, so chest.moneyworth is going to be a, let's use get random value again from, let's also go from 10 to 100. Okay, so now this chest should appear. It's been set where the orc was. And let's render that chest. So down in our render function here, our render logic, um, let's see. Okay, so if the orc zone is the player zone, so basically we're still in this if right here. So if the orc is alive, draw the tile. Otherwise, if the chest is alive, draw the tile at chest.x, chest.y, and coordinates 9, 3. So that should be this, this texture image right here of our treasure chest. Okay, so let's go ahead and draw that out. Okay, so notice how there's no treasure chest in this zone, which is good. It's a good sign. We enter our dungeon. We bump into the orc until it dies. And we've got a chest. Okay, and we can't pass through it. Okay, but we also can't do anything with it. So let's, if uh, is key pressed key G. Okay, so if, let's just cut and paste this. Uh, so if our player X equals chest X and player Y equals chest Y. So if we're on top of our chest, okay, then what we want to do is, okay, we want to turn off the chest. So chest is alive equals false. And we want to assign the player money. We want to add the chest money to the player money. So chest player dot money plus equals chest.money. Keep hitting the orc. Orc is dead. Something's wrong. So what's happening is it's getting stuck in this, in this if statement here because we are at the same coordinates of the orc. And okay, so we need to add another case here. So and orc is alive. Okay, so if our player zone matches the orc zone and the orc is alive and our x and y of the player matches the x and y of the orc, then go into this if conditional where we do all this funky stuff. Otherwise, update the player and update the camera target. So let's do the same thing. Or let's run this now and just verify that everything works. Orc is dead. We can now wander on top of the chest. Hit G. And we're not displaying our money but we can hopefully have confidence that since we saw the chest disappear, that we did indeed take the money. So let's display our player, player money in our draw text section here. Let's add some more two new lines, player XP and player money. So we want to draw text using text format of our player XP, converting our player dot experience into the string. Same thing with our player money. And then we're going to be drawing them at X and Y of 15 and 70, a font size 14 to match everything else, and font color yellow. And the money we'll be drawing at 15 and X, X of 15, Y of 90, font size of 14 and yellow. So let's go back and run this and see how we've updated the display. Okay, so now we can see in the top left, we've got our XP and our money. So let's go ahead and kill that orc. Okay, boom, we can see our XP went up by 37. And then our money is going to go up right here when we hit G. Boom, 72. 
Okay, so now let's go into the fun stuff of adding some sound effects. So that's all of the logic and basically graphics we're going to put into this. Again, building an RPG is a really, it's a larger endeavor than you think as you get into it. There's a lot more things to take care of and manage. Uh, you can see right away that we had to split up our, we had to track what zone the player is in, what zone the entities are in. And, you know, right now we're kind of doing things inefficiently because we're comparing directly against our orc and dungeon gate and our chest. But in a regular level, you might have like hundreds of orcs and dozens of chests and things like that. So what, what you might want to consider as a follow-up exercise to this project is converting this into a little bit more of a generic list of entities that you go through and then process uh, each update of the game. So that way you would go through all the entities, compare it with the player, keep the player outside of that list of entities just to make it easier to compare against the player and then update those entities as you need to for your game. Okay, or we can do that in a follow-up video of this. Feel free to leave a comment down below if that's what you would prefer. We can for sure get into doing something like that. Okay, so let's load up some sound effects. I've got some sound effects in the in the asset folder of this project. So let's go ahead and go back into our section at the top. And let's now set up some sound and music. So after our after our texture declaration here, let's update this with the sound and music. So we're gonna have five sounds. We're gonna have our grass sound effect, uh, our stone, basically, which is basically dirt. Maybe I should rena rename this to dirt. And then we've got uh, an attack sound, a death sound when the orc dies, and then coins when we pick up, a ch pick up the chest. And we're gonna have two music tracks here. I've got a light and a dark ambient tracks. And so basically when we're in the overworld, when we're in the forest, we're playing the light background music. And when we're in the dungeon, it's the dark ambient music. So let's go back into our startup and let's load up our sound effects and our music. So back in our game startup function at the end here, we've set up our player, our entities, our grids, our camera. Let's go ahead and load up our sound effects. Okay, so we're calling the load sound of our grass wave file and we're gonna assign it to our sound array of index sound foot grass. And then same thing with our concrete one sound effect, we're gonna load into sound foot stone and the same thing with sound attack, sound death and sound coins. And then we're gonna do, be doing the same thing with load music stream. We're gonna be loading two MP3s, which are in the assets folder and then assigning them to music light ambience and music dark ambience of the music array. So before we do anything else, let's make sure we unload everything. So in the game shutdown, let's go into game shutdown. And before we close the audio device, let's go through our uh, array of sounds and call unload sound for each item in the sounds array. And for each item in the music array, we just wanna stop the music stream and then unload the music stream. Back in the game startup, uh, we ended things off by saying, by using the play music stream and then giving it the index of the light ambient music. So when we start in our world right away, we're gonna be hearing this background music. Now, how Raylib handles the music is that each frame of our game, we need to update the music stream to help Raylib make sure that the file is, the music file is being constantly updated. Okay, so in our game update function here at the top, we can do it right away. If player.zone equals zone world, then we wanna update the music stream of the light ambience. Otherwise, if our zone is the dungeon, then we wanna update the music stream of our dark ambient, okay? And so there's one thing left we need to do. When we enter, when we switch between the dungeons via the gate, or the dungeon in the world via the gate, we also wanna update the the music. Okay, so what we want to do is when we move from the world into the dungeon, 
we want to okay we want to we want to call stop music stream and then we want to pass in the light ambience track that we've been playing and then we want to play music stream of the dark ambience and then similarly when we pass from the dungeon back into the world we want to stop the dark ambient music and start up the light ambient music now another effect i ran into is that i wanted to have a sound effect for the grass so for each time you move each time the player moves then the each time you take a step then it'll play some a grass sound effect so i, I created a variable here called has key been pressed a boolean and then so within each of these keyboard handlers we just set that boolean to true so let's go ahead and copy and paste this into each then so afterwards okay so if we're updating our player so down here so if has key has been pressed so if our player zone is zone world then we want to play the sound sound foot grass okay and then otherwise if the player zone equals zone dungeon then we want to play the sound so play sound and use the sounds array and then pass in the index of sound foot stone and then if we pick up the if we pick up the chest we are going to play a sound effect for that so let's go down to the g so if we've played if we picked up the chest we're going to use play sound and calling the sounds array of the index sound underscore coins and similarly we are going to create a attack sound so if if our health is less than zero then do all this logic otherwise we just want to play the sound of our attack sound and when we kill the orc we want to play the sound of death so play sound sounds underscore death okay so let's try all this out okay so we've got our ambient light music we've got a grass sound effect every time we take a step let's go into the gate okay we've changed to the dark ambient music and we've got the sort of the concrete sound effect and let's go ahead and hit the orc okay whoa okay we've killed the orc and now let's see what happens when we hit, get the chest and we get the money sound effect okay that's really cool let's go back to the light ambient music very cool okay so the last thing i wanted to put together was some combat text for how much damage we're doing to the orc now again there's many ways to do it and the raylib um, faq has a link to let's see if i can pull it up here so right here there's an article here how do i make a timer Okay, so Raylib has no built-in timer system. You're expected to keep track of time in your own code. You can do this with the get time and get frame time functions. Below is an example of a simple timer struct and functions to use it. So we keep track of a start time and then a lifetime, a duration of this timer in the structure. And then so we have a function here for start timer, a start timer done, and a get elapsed of that timer right here. So we're going to drop that into our code i've made a few modifications but for the most part it's working on that same simple structure okay so after we declare everything here so maybe after our camera oh after our entity oh what the heck we'll just do it last after all of our entities okay so i put a link in right here in the code back to that faq article and so i've got a timer structure 
of a start time, a lifetime, and then basically if the timer is active or not. And then we've got functions here for a start timer, is timer done, and then it get elapsed of that timer. Okay, and then so we are gonna declare a S timer of combat text timer. That's what I'm calling it. So basically right above the orc, we're gonna display the damage that the orc has been taking each round. And presumably if we ever add player, like the orc being able to attack the player back, then we will add another text timer, like another text label above the player with the damage that the player is taking each round. Right now, of course, you might notice that the orc can't hit the player back. The, the player can just be hitting the orc. Okay, so we've got our timer declared right up here. And then all we need to do, okay, so with our as, um, or in the update functions, when we're going into our logic of the orc damage, okay, so right here. So let's put a new if statement in here. So if combat text timer is not active, let's set the combat text timer to active and let's start the timer. So we wanna pass in that combat text timer structure or that declaration, that instance, 0.5 seconds long that it'll do, be displayed for. In the far outside of our update loop, so after the end of everything, let's put a, hand, let's put a check here. So if is timer done, so if the combat text timer is done, then switch off the, the timer, set the active field to false. Okay, and then in the game render function, all we have to do in our orc section, so we wanna draw the orc, and so in between drawing the orc and the chest, so if the combat text timer is active, we wanna call draw text, and then format the text to the damage that the orc has taken, which is being tracked in that orc.damage field, and then we wanna draw it at 10 pixels above the orc, the orc's position at the orc x position and then 10 units 10 pixel units above the orc's y position font size of nine and then yellow and let's go ahead and oh i didn't even draw i didn't even create the functions okay so underneath our draw tile function let's go ahead and update our new start timer functions so I guess within here we can put a uh, timer. So timer start time is get time and then timer lifetime is lifetime. So if we call a start timer, we pass in the timer we want to work with. Uh, so we set, we call get time on the start time value and start time variable. And then the lifetime variable will track the lifetime that we want to create the timer for. Uh, and then we've got an is timer done method, which takes in a timer structure and then we call get time minus the timer.start time. And we check if that's bigger than or equal to the timer.lifetime. And then to get the elapsed time of the timer, we pass in the timer and we just call get time minus the start time of that timer struct. Okay, let's go ahead and run this. And let's go to our orc. Okay, let's zoom in a little bit here. Okay. Okay. Notice how the damage we're doing to the orc is being above it in that combat text. Pretty cool. Boom. Okay, that orc is dead. All right. 66 coins, copper. Okay, and that's really about it. That's all I wanted to cover in this video. There is so much more to do, and there's so many ways that we can restructure this code base. I'm sure you've probably noticed how, how many possibilities that we have now to update the logic, to be a little bit more generic and handle a lot more things than just a, a chest, an orc, and a dungeon gate. But I thought this was a really good introduction. If you aren't aware of it, there is a annual game jam competition called the 7DRL. If you're unaware of it, on itch.io, there is a 7DRL challenge for 2024, basically for every year, but this happens to be 2024 that I'm recording this. And it is a seven-day game jam competition in which you create a your own roguelike within seven days. And in 2024, this happens to be the 20th anniversary, which is really, really cool. So if you want to check that out, or if you want to play previous entries, then just go ahead and check out the 7DRL challenge on the itch.io website.
I'll put a link in the description to that down below as well. But I hope you enjoyed everything here. I think this was a really cool tutorial. I had a lot of fun. There's a lot more ways to grow this project. We can add you know, database support with SQLite so that you can track a lot of entities in a proper database. Uh, we can have you know, like a map, a map editor where we can create proper maps of like a, a town and our world and our dungeon versus just randomly, randomly creating them with some for loops. So we can get really fancy with this. We can also have quests. We can have, you know, there, there's so many different options and fun things that you can put into an RPG. I really hope you take this code and start building from it. You know, make it your own, add to it, explore different things. And leave a comment down below if you want to, if there's something else you want to see in this. Maybe I turn this into some kind of series of uh, doing different tasks for this RPG example and building it up from here. Okay, my name is Wazoo. Feel free to like, and like this video, subscribe to the channel for notifications on other projects we want to tackle. And I will see you in the next one, folks. Peace.